In this final part of my making of fragments, I'm going to take a, a deeper dive into the actual content of the film, or films I guess you could say. So instead of talking about how we actually made the film on a technical level, like in part one, I will elucidate some of the meaning of the film on a symbolic level, and kind of just go through each individual fragment one by one that way. And uh, although not 100% necessary, I still would highly appreciate it if you watch the first part of this little making of series. I've always enjoyed making of videos and in all honesty i find them more intriguing than the actual films in a lot of cases links to that and to the playlist two fragments will be in the description below so i'd highly appreciate it if you guys check that out the overall theme of fragments is memory and time how memories affect us and how people can remain stuck in both good and bad memories there's a lot being said about loss and moving on in life as well, as our main character is literally being forced to remain in the past and can't move forward both physically and emotionally. Holy crap, I sound pretentious, but let's just get through this. The first fragment begins with our main character, Taylor Cole, walking through a field. And I always like to start my films, both short and feature, with a flash forward. These little glitches that you see are kind of like glitches in the Matrix in a sense where each fragmented memory that is being remembered by Taylor is glitched out. And in this case, he's remembering a fight he had with his girlfriend the day before. His eyes are white here, and originally this was going to play into the story in a much more prominent way. Like I said in part one, the original treatment for fragments was much more linear and straightforward. The eyes were, and still are, meant to show how people don't really sleep in this world anymore and are instead um, being forced to choose which memories to keep and which ones to discard. We originally had like a Black Mirror-esque sequence where Taylor was flipping through like holographic memories, Iron Man style. We shot it on a green screen and besides it not working on a technical level, it was just a little too science fiction-y in the end and we felt like it would just take the audience out of it. So if you have an eye for penmanship, you would notice that the writing on the post-it note in the bathroom has a different handwriting than the rest. That's because someone else wrote it. Maybe Sam before their fight? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I really like this concept of a man leaving post-it notes around to remember menial things about his life. It's kind of memento-esque, I guess you could say. I do wish we went more crazy and put even more <laughs> post-it notes just everywhere, but hey, low-budget blues. The jump scare here shows that this post-it note triggers some sort of memory fragment. Every time a memory pops up, it's distorted. It's really glitchy. And, uh, but we will dive deeper into that later. This gimbal shot is really interesting because every time someone opens the door to the outside world, I wanted an almost blown out white effect. And throughout the film, whenever someone opens a door, it's just like a sea of white that hits them. And that's because I wanted the outside world to almost feel new to them and to kind of give off the idea that they're stepping into an unknown world, which is just the outside world. This car gag was really cool. It was an on-set improv that really adds to the world because we did a few shots where he just goes straight to his car, but it doesn't really make too much sense. So this just adds that extra layer of world building. <laughs> Through the writing of this film, I would constantly think about things like, how does he remember how to drive or, or eat or speak? and I kind of just had to turn that part of my brain off because once you start thinking about this film logically, you can really start to poke some holes in it. My my explanation would be that Remembe gives everyone sort of a baseline memories thing so that people could function still. But again, I guess it, it you know doesn't make too much sense. But art doesn't have to make sense. So, so what do you think? What, what do you think happened? Fragment number two begins by shedding more light onto the fight between Sam and Taylor. And as you can tell, it's a memory by the fact that it's, you know, visually distorted. The score here is from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross from The Social Network. And at the end, you know, I just kind of liked it so much I kept it. It was a temp track, but it just worked so well I kept it. So shout out to them. So this scene is really the inciting incident to the film. I guess you could say it's the only structure we have to the film in a sense. Um... But in this scene, Sam erased Taylor from her memory. And the thing I like about this scene is the dichotomy between Sam's and Taylor's decision about which memories to erase. Because Taylor chose to erase the argument, where Sam chose to delete him entirely. 
And that touches on uh, the different way people look back on certain memories, because I know people who look back on certain things like troubled relationships with with rose tinted glasses. But then on the flip side of that coin, I know others who only remember the negative of most situations or relationships that they are in or whatever. Um, and I think the scene kind of shows both reactions to that. So point is, whether it be out of spite or uh, in the heat of the moment, uh, Sam erased him from her memory. Uh, funny thing is, she really slapped him multiple times, by the way. That is not a sound effect. Wait for me. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Remembank. Remembank in the original script was like nothing. It served as nothing but a plot device to serve as exposition. But as we started to get more experimental with the film, not only did Remembank become a bigger part of it, but Remembank also became like the invisible narrator of the film. Remembank, uh, just to explain, is an organization in conjunction with the U.S. government uh, that developed the technology to remove one's selected memories. It's kind of, you know, uh, internal sunshine meets 1984 uh, to a smaller extent. And uh, most of that, though, came after the fact. Uh, for example, in this scene, Taylor was actually originally going to be video chatting with a real person named Terry. But in the editing, I thought it would be more interesting to show how disconnected and frustrating the process really is. Because if you guys are like me, you just press zero a bunch of times like, can I talk to a real person, please? So in the editing, Terry became Terry. Trans platform electronic representative interface. And I really like this frame here because those are real family photos from Trevor and showing him being trapped by happy memories he can't remember I think is a really cool visual metaphor. We did many different takes here with Trevor um, exploring different levels uh, everything from mildly annoyed to yelling in anger. Uh, in the end we decided to go a more milder reaction of frustration rather than anger but still kept it a little angry at the end when he slams the laptop. <laughs> This is another flash forward here. I use the ending of the story as a sort of framing device for the film. It's not the only framing device of the film, but the ending does come in throughout the film. So here we see Taylor um, going to his best friend's house, a best friend he doesn't really know. And like I said earlier, these little glitches are fragments of memories. So even though technically Taylor doesn't know Dallas, he feels a sense that he's been there before. And in the memory, he's wearing a different shirt because again, it's a previous memory that's sort of being tapped into. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go frame by frame, you can actually see the file number of the memory. Memory underscore 37849. So that's memory number uh, 37,849. Hey, yo, Dallas, someone's at the door. So that's actually my voice as the roommate. Dallas was always meant to have a roommate, but in the beginning, he didn't appear until the garage scene in fragment number three. But in the edit, I thought we sort of needed to establish that Dallas had a roommate so it doesn't just pop up. So what I did was I just put a microphone in my living room, the same microphone I'm using right now, and just yelled from across the room. Uh, but that voiceover wasn't recorded until maybe a year after this scene was shot. This is Taylor, quote unquote, meeting Dallas for the first time. And I wanted like a natural comfortability between them, even though technically they don't know each other and they've never met because instinctively they know each other, but their minds, you know, are warped. So the only thing they know is that they're each other's best friend. In the end, it says that Taylor's memories are down to 23. And uh, that comes back in uh, fragment number three. Fragment number three begins with, in my personal opinion, the worst scene in the movie. The reason I think it's the worst is as follows. This guy, me. I was not supposed to play John. We had an actor who was supposed to play this part and he dropped out day of. So I had to fill in. You got to do what you got to do. But that's why I don't really fit the scenario of a mechanic. Let, let, let's get into what the scene's about, though. So this is John, Dallas's roommate. And here he tells Taylor how Dallas passed away trying to crack the code and that the government came and scooped him up. The reason this scene starts fragment number three is because I really wanted to tell the story out of order. So going into the next scene, knowing that this conversation is the last they will ever have, I think brings a much more emotional weight to it. I will say, though, this scene ends with what I think is the best line in Fragments. And kudos to Trevor, because I feel like that is a very hard line to get right, and he absolutely nailed the delivery. 
Do you know Dallas, or...? Uh, no. No, we were best friends, though. So after the best line in Fragments comes what I personally think is the best scene in Fragments. There is a lot to unpack here, so I'm going to start with this. Dallas and Taylor finally meet up to talk about life, and in the beginning of the conversation, the aspect ratio visibly changes. Throughout the film, the aspect ratio is very intentional, and a majority of it is shot in a 4x3 aspect ratio. This was a decision made in editing to enhance the idea of how trapped Taylor feels in this world. Uh, the funny thing is, is that we shot this back in 2017, and before the release, a ton of films started to hop on that trend. And I'm not saying that I was ahead of the time or anything, by any means. It, Xavier Dolan was doing this way before most, but I kind of thought it was funny that so many films started to do that after we filmed it and started editing it with that idea in mind. Just complete coincidence. During the scene that takes place in the present, or in the real world, the aspect ratio is four by three. But whenever a memory pops up, it reverts to full screen. And during the Remembank commercial, there's a 235 aspect ratio to highlight two things. One, that it's a commercial, and two, that it's produced and artificial. Dallas here explains that he's doing much worse than Taylor, and that he's trying anything he can to get by. He has a glow of optimism around him much more than Taylor does, and he cares about Taylor, but Taylor is very emotionally distant in this scene. So during the part where Dallas makes up a bunch of memories, he's trying to get Taylor to realize the importance of memory in general, good or bad. The most crucial part of the scene is the role reversal that Taylor plays in it compared to his relationship with Sam. When you're depressed, your mind plays tricks on you. It tells you that nobody is there for you and that your friends aren't really your friends, which is a blatant lie, but that's the way the parasite of depression works. So even when people care about you, you can't see it. Dallas is the Taylor in the situation and Taylor has become the Sam. So Taylor is being just as cold to Dallas as Sam was to him earlier. And I think that ties into the world itself, which in general symbolizes depression. And Taylor just keeps running towards someone that isn't good for him and ignoring those who actually care. <clears throat> this scene also ties back into the garage scene earlier as Dallas is talking about how he found a way to unlock all your memories, which is a very dangerous and illegal procedure. So whether he died trying to crack the code or the government caught wind and killed him beforehand, I don't know, I guess that's kind of left ambiguous. Brian and Trevor, let me just tell you, they killed it. They did such a good job. Brian brought so much to the page that it blew all of us away. And Trevor, although more subtle, shows so much through his eyes. I mean, look at his eyes here. You can see how much pain and emotion he's holding back. It's freaking great. Uh, the aspect ratio begins to close here um, as we show that the brief moment of levity is now gone, um, which is how depression works in waves. So we see Taylor here sitting in front of a RoboCop poster. And if you've ever seen RoboCop, you know that it's a story of a cop who loses his memory and then is used by the bigger machine to do his bidding. So the parallels are great. Totally coincidental because we didn't plan that, but I can easily BS my way through that deeper meaning. So that's awesome. Don't bullshit a bullshitter. So fragment number four, uh, the last fragment, um, brings the whole Remembank framing device to the forefront. Uh, it's crazy how in the beginning, Remembank almost played no part. And then the final product almost became like the unseen narrator of the whole thing. The beginning of fragment number four is different because it starts with the end card from the previous fragments, only this time it's being typed. So to talk about the end cards, the end cards are important when trying to decipher fragment number four. And the reason why it's being typed is because to jump ahead here, Taylor is left with just one single memory. And in Remembank, whenever someone dwindles down to just one memory, the system can like no longer be automated and has to be put in manually. I kind of like I sort of picture like some random Remembank employee in a dark room sitting at a really beat up computer watching Taylor's life through this broken computer and everything that we've seen so far is what he or she has seen. These driving shots I just liked because we had them and they don't really have any significance. I just liked them. So a quick detour here. A while ago, I said that this film was controlled chaos. To me, nothing shows that better than this scene. 
We shot this scene three times from each side at least. What you see on screen is a combination of almost every single take. Hey. Hey. Do you want to go for a walk? Yeah. So the audio from take two is being put over the visual from take one and I just had to match the lip movements and I liked the visual of take three but I didn't like a certain ad lib so I replaced it with another one from take two. It's, it's crazy. Th this whole film is controlled chaos. It's kind of insane. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this conversation between Sam and Taylor because there isn't too much to unpack that, you know, already isn't said on screen. He's trying to force something that won't work and she pushes him away. And the beginning of the conversation is actually the start of fragment number two, so it gives context to that line uh, as well. But the reason she goes back to him at the door is because even though she erased him from her memory, she still dreams about him, 51st date style. <laughs> Deep cut, but yeah, I, I, I thought about that scene in 51st Dates when I, when I thought about this dialogue. <laughs> I don't know who you are, Henry, but I dream about you. You remember your dreams? Fragments. Did you see what I did there? Did you hear it? It's, it's the name of the film. Yeah. You said it! So the jump cuts in the film are all calculated as well. Whenever there's an extended pause within a conversation, I thought it would be interesting to cut that out. Uh, just, I don't know, adds kind of to the fragmented nature of the film. So this conversation is pretty straightforward. Taylor tries to hold on to some hope before he loses his memory. Um, and he realizes that he's not going to find it in Sam. And the conversation kind of unlocks that realization in him. And part of it comes from her, but another part of it comes from himself. Because he already kind of knows it deep down. So we go back to the Remembank scene and it cross cuts with the other framing device the end of the film, the sunset. Uh, this to me is the most emotional fragment. Seeing Taylor wake up and kind of aimlessly walk through the train tracks, I think is a really beautiful, but also sad kind of image. And uh, like I said before, the aspect ratio changes from the real world to the memory. So on the train track scene, whenever Taylor is being viewed in third person, it's four by three, and they're also in normal motion, but when the slow motion part happens, there is no aspect ratio because we are viewing his perspective. He's what gives us a purpose. His white eyes bookend the film from the first time you see Taylor to the last time you see him, and he smiles at the sunset, content with the memory he has chosen. At the end of the film, Taylor is uh, down to only one memory, and the very last shot is the Remembank file typing one into his memory capacity, a capacity which we saw dwindle with each fragment. So from now on, Taylor can only relive one memory, and I won't reveal what memory that is, but I will say that there are small things throughout the film that hint toward which memory he chose to live in forever. And it's a very personal memory to me as well. And that's Fragments for you guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to me ramble about this film we made three years ago. It was a very important film to me, and I'm very proud of it. Um, and I'm sure everyone involved uh, feels the same way, or at least I hope they do. But uh, uh, thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys later.